Our call to worship comes from Psalm 99. I invite you to lend your voices as we read this together. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. We praise your great and awesome name. Holy is the Lord our God. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. We extol the Lord our God. We worship at his footstool. Holy is the Lord our God. As we worship the Lord our God today, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Take the time now to share the peace of Christ with those around you. Second Peter 1, 16 through 21. I'll be reading from the NIV. For we do not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. As we continue to worship, everyone remains seated as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. <laughs>
scripture lesson for this morning is from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses, Elijah, Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm sure some of y'all can top this, but I have a coffee mug, and I drank from it this morning. I have a coffee mug that's 28 years old. As I start thinking about that, it's green glass, and I bought it at Six Flags because 28 years ago, uh, this spring, a new roller coaster opened at Six Flags, called the Viper. <laughs> and the Viper was touted as the world's first launch 
roller coaster, the same technology that helps F-14s take off of the deck of an aircraft carrier was what propelled the cars down the track at, on the Viper. And I went with friends and we rode this new roller coaster for the very first time. And it launched us down the track, getting us out of that little barn at 60 something miles an hour, through a loop and up an incline. And then it drops us back through the loop, back through the gatehouse and up another incline and back into the station and that's it. <laughs> and it was incredible. The Viper's not there anymore, but I still have the coffee mug because during that opening season for the Viper, what should happen to you, but please exit through the gift shop. What do you do with your mountaintop experiences? What do you do with your exhilaration? What do you do when you are so thrilled at what you've experienced that you kind of want to hold on to that? Peter had this in mind, I believe, at the Transfiguration. He and James and John go along with Jesus and they have this mountaintop experience because it took place on a mountain. This might be where we get the phrase. I've been on mountaintops sometimes where things weren't all that great. Like bears getting into whatever you brought with you for camping. But they have a good experience. It's thrilling. It's exhilarating. They get on top of this mountain with Jesus and he is as... Luke tells, as Matthew tells us, transfigured before them, his face shines brightly and his clothes are dazzling white. And then Moses and Elijah show up and they start talking with Jesus. And it's there that Peter senses something really great is happening here. This is exhilarating. This is thrilling. He goes to Jesus and says, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three booths. Let's build three little, little huts. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And I get the feeling that the next breath, Peter might say, and we'll build a gift shop. <laughs> It's good for us to be here. Let them come to us instead of walking all around Galilee trying to get the message to everybody else. What if word about what's happening on our mountaintop gets out to the community around us? It gets out to the world around us. What if they find out that you're here, but they also find out that Moses and Elijah are here too? Can't they just come to us? and then exit through the gift shop. I've got a great design for a coffee mug in mind. Maybe theirs won't have a coiled up snake on it. I just thought that was perfect for coffee. That's how I like my coffee. So we, we find Jesus and three disciples in this situation that is so uh, different. And it's, it has its very unusual qualities. And Peter stops in the middle of it to talk about how thrilled he is. But what's going on here? We, we tend to scratch our heads to kind of make sense of what happened in this transfiguration story. What, what was really going on? What did it really look like? Where did Moses and Elijah come from? And what does it all mean? And what, just what happened? And there are a number of biblical commentaries that you can pick up that will just say, this is a complex mystery, which basically is Bible scholars speak for, y'all figure it out. <laughs> or as uh, the joke about the little kid on the airplane, when you meet Jesus, you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some some things that we can probably attach some handles to. We can think about how Matthew tries to tell this story um, in a very um, 
complex and fractured situation uh, that that when the Matthew church comes along and they begin to tell the gospel story about Jesus, uh, there are a lot of factors at play here and there's a good bit of opposition. There are opposition there's an opposition from the next worship center down the street um, that, that the Matthew church finds itself in opposition with its neighbors about the identity of Jesus and who he is. And certainly if you kind of pull the context of time and history into play here, there's this issue with Rome. And Matthew trying to tell a story about 10 years after Jerusalem was destroyed. And you can hear the, the tones of something apocalyptic playing out, a story being told for the sake of the faithful, to stay faithful that in the end, we're all going to be dressed in white robes. In the end, we're all going to see this world a whole lot differently. What's going on here? And so we're presented with this picture of Jesus in dazzling white. His face shines. And there's a good bit of foreshadowing here. A picture of what will come when Jesus and his body is glorified, a foreshadowing of the resurrection. And it's so interesting to me that the foreshadowing of the resurrection is this picture of light. I guess we got to figure out a different way of saying this. It's the four lightning of Jesus that we're talking about. A picture of the one who will suffer, and that's what he just talked about in the chapter before. The one who will suffer now being raised up and he is not only transfigured before them, but this transformation that takes place in Jesus' resurrection is one that is eternal. And that's what shows up in short form right in front of Peter and James and John. And yet we can analyze this idea of Moses and Elijah showing up to have a conversation with Jesus, sort of a, a, a conversation with the elders, the, the folks in your life who are very influential come along and give you one last word of advice before they pat you on the back and let you carry the torch. And so we see Jesus kind of being the one who is the culmination of all that has been taught that is connected with Moses, all that's been taught that has been connected with Elijah. Or if we consider a passage that the Sunday school group was looking at this morning of the Jesus's parable of the rich man and Lazarus, what Abraham, what Abraham shouts down to the rich man is, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Now, when we studied that passage in seminary, we would always start giggling because somebody along the way said, Moses and the prophets sounds like one of those groups from the 50s. <laughs> right alongside Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs and Otis Day and the Knights. Aren't real groups, by the way. <laughs> they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Because what happens in this passage is Jesus has a conversation with Moses and the prophet. And then later it's the voice of God that says about Jesus. This is my son. Listen to him. Because he has a way to help you understand what you're doing when you do listen to Moses and the prophets. Now all of that takes place. And the disciples have absolutely no problem with it. Isn't that strange? They're thrilled. Peter's, Peter's take on that whole situation of seeing Jesus burst into light in front of them and Moses and Elijah show up is, this is cool, let's stay. Let's stay. Maybe we can stay up here for a whole two weeks and not have to go to class. It's happening in America. <laughs> but let's stay but then God speaks another very biblical image that, that Jesus' disciples would have understood looking back into their Bibles in the, in the books of Moses 
They would have understood that when the cloud comes down, it's time for God to speak. And that's what happens. A bright cloud surrounds them, and the voice of God is heard here. This is my son, the beloved one. I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. It's that moment when they personally experience all that they've imagined from their own vacation Bible school that they're on a mountain they go hmm that happened in the books of Moses the cloud comes down on the mountain well that, that happened I remember reading about that in Exodus and then God speaks and what do they remember from their Bible school? No one can see the face of God and live. And if they've heard God's voice, what happens if they turn around and actually see God? They won't burst into light. They will burst into dust. They fall down in fear. Because in that moment, they have actually found themselves in the presence of God. And it takes the very physical incarnate form of God, Jesus, to stop and get them out of that situation of what you could call dead. It's Jesus who noticed this in this passage, touches them, and then speaks. It's Jesus who has touched others to heal them. And in this moment, that touch is needed to bring them back into reality, to bring them back into this life from a state of paralyzing fear. And Jesus reestablishes what we kind of see as routine in the ministry of Jesus. He touches them, which they needed. And then we see Jesus give instructions. And when you read through the Gospel of Matthew, pay attention to the imperatives. Go, get up. He tells them, gives them the imperative here, get up. And don't be afraid. When we hear Jesus say, don't be afraid, something important is about to happen. Now what takes place in this situation is that they don't stay on the mountaintop anymore. They move along with Jesus toward the places where people need healing. They get up and go with Jesus toward the places where people need Jesus. I feel pretty strongly that you and I have gone to those places. We have, we've had our mountaintop experiences. I sure hope it's right now, but we can, <laughs> we've had our mountaintop experiences. We've had our moments, even of feeling this close, powerful, spiritual connection with Jesus. We have started singing, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And yet what, what we will discover is that the most important part of all of those worship experiences has been the benediction, where a good word has been spoken that sends us on our way to walk with Jesus to the places where people need him. And I know that you encounter people every day who need to know Jesus and encounter people every day who need that healing that only can come from his touch. But somehow Jesus has said, you're going to be someone who does it for me. We have our moments where we see Jesus transformed, transfigured right in front of us. And yet, how this story kind of resolves is that it's the Jesus they're very used to who touches them and instructs them and brings them back to life to tell them not to be afraid. 
have you I imagine our worship experiences speak to that. But then if Jesus can be transfigured, I get the feeling that it's, that's a possibility for all of us, that the, that the transfigured Jesus points ahead in the story to the resurrection of Jesus, but it's Jesus' promise to us that we'll all be raised up with him that we'll all be transformed, that we'll leave places of darkness and find ourselves in his glorious light. And therefore, this, this uh, bursting into light, this transfiguration is, is a reality for, for all of us, for every, even for the people that Jesus leads us to in order that they are changed in order that the world changes. Have you ever seen someone transfigured? Maybe you have, you just don't, you, you might not have the words to attach to those situations. Let me tell you a couple of stories here. I was in the hospital where a man was rushed into emergency surgery and rushed right back out because there wasn't anything they could do for him. His sister stood around the bed in the intensive care unit tending to him, keeping vigil, being present as he died. And I, I stood there and felt absolutely helpless, except I'm just supposed to be the chaplain. I couldn't help but notice that one of those sisters, wrapped up in a hospital blanket to try and stay warm, just stood beside the bed, and you could watch not only her heart break, but it looked like her soul was being torn out of her body. She loved her brother that much. And it was one of the most genuinely real, and I know that's redundant, one of the most genuinely real moments I'd ever seen. And all I could describe it with was I watched an angel break down and weep. See how she loved him. That was a transfiguration story. Do you remember uh, about a year and a half ago when we did our semicolon? emphasis for a few weeks on the creation story, looking at all the ands in the creation story, and God said, and God said. And I talked to you about people who have in, had contemplated or even tried to commit suicide might get um, semicolon tattoos on their wrists as a reminder that their story's not finished. Well, I was at a restaurant getting a to-go order and it was very busy. And the young woman behind the counter had found herself subject to all that busyness. And I think she probably showed up to work a little bit tired to begin with, but don't we all? And just looking at her, I could tell she had been through a lot and probably going through a lot in her life. Um, she seemed to be awfully underweight. You could kind of look at, at her face and see that there was more than just the, the loss of weight there, but that something had been weighing heavily on this person. And the busyness of kitchen and cash register all pouring down on her. And I told her, you know, that I'd call in an order. And as she reached up to touch the computer screen in front of her to pull up my order, I saw on her wrist a semicolon tattoo. And I said, just quite simply, hey, I like your tattoo. And I tapped my wrist. And she was transfigured right in front of me. The brightest smile came across her face. Her eyes lit up 
And it was just for that moment that she knew somebody else knew and cared. And it, it hovered in the room between them. If our transfiguration is being brought about by resurrection, and as the story in the gospel plays out, this is, this is a preview here. And it moves us along the way in the story where Jesus' resurrection is going to lead to our own. Then it's a testimony about how Jesus welcomes us to walk along with him, not cling to these mountaintop experiences, but carry the good news with us into the valleys and the places where people need to know who he is. And so when we go with Jesus, knowing not only that we're walking toward the places of darkness and pain where that light needs to be, that we walk with Jesus that way. It's a testimony that things are going to change. It's a testimony that God is making the world right through Jesus and the testimony of his church. And that is the good news that lights up the world. And that's the good news that bursts into extraordinary light between us. Amen. serve the Lord to everywhere you go and stop and tell Jesus it's good for us to be here. Well, he already knows that. And it's there the voice of God is going to ask you to listen to Moses and the prophets and to Jesus, his son. And may all who you find in those places know that you are faithful and that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen.